University of Louisiana at Lafayette, pursuing her Bachelor of Fine Arts with a concentration in Graphic Arts and Design. Gabrielle's interests include the preservation of the Cajun culture within her community, as well as Southern Louisiana art, and she will be featured in the upcoming Witch of Morinpa exhibit in July, which focuses on Louisiana folklore. Please welcome Gabrielle Guidry. Slavery is a concept that is relatively foreign to most of us. It's a difficult and painful idea for us to imagine, but it is something real that did exist in both the United States and in Russia. In Russia, serfdom was very similar to the type of slavery that existed in America. Serfdom in Russia can be traced all the way back to the 11th century, but total enslavement did not become widespread until about 1550. The serf was an unfree peasant, peasants were poor, low class farmers who lived and farmed on no nobleman's land. It was because a person lived on nobleman's land that he was a serf and bound to the landowner. It was the most dominant form of relationship between wealthy people and peasants in Russia. There's one thing, at least in theory, that distinguished serfdom in Russia from slavery in America. Serfs were still people. Slaves in America were always viewed as the disposable property of their slave masters. Landowners did not own did not own their serfs, although this difference became hard to see as serfdom and subjection increased. Around 1550, Russian serfdom became much more oppressive than it had previously been. In 1658, fleeing from a landowner became a criminal offense. Landowners could transfer their serfs to other landowners while keeping their personal belongings. Essentially, landowners had total control and were able to do almost whatever they wanted to their serfs, except kill them. By the 1800s, serfdom in Russia was so widespread that 80% of Russian peasants were serfs. It was not until 1861 that serfdom was officially abolished and over 23 million serfs were freed. Slavery in the U.S. happened between 1619 and 1865. Slaves were considered property, not humans, and they dominated the South, shaping it both economically and culturally. By 1860, there were over 4 million slaves in the U.S and in the South they made up one third of the population. It was seen as a necessary evil and people argued that slaves benefited from slavery because they were fed and clothed, which is definitely not the case. Slaves on plantations were forced to work 18 hours a day from sunrise to sunset. Before 1774, in some states, it was even legal for a white man to murder a slave without cause. Slave owners benefited from having African slaves for many reasons, including the fact that they couldn't speak English and had no knowledge of the land made it difficult for them to escape. The fact that their skin color was different made them easy to recognize and keep track of and in bondage. Most, many slaves were slaves for life and never got the chance to see freedom. The majority of the artworks we have that depicted the systems of servitude and slavery in early 19th century Russia and the United States were made by white artists. The outlook on slavery during this time, whether in paintings, engravings, music, or literature, mainly comes from a small section of the spectrum of, of the, the ethnicities of the world. It was not until later on in the century that African American artists really began to produce artworks on their depiction of slavery, such as Scott Duncanson and Henry Tanner. Because historians are limited by what documents have existed or survived from this earlier period, there's a threshold to what we know about the subject and what we can interpret from unbiased works and writings of this time. Winslow Homer is often regarded by many as the greatest American painter of the 19th century. Largely self-taught, Homer began his career working as a commercial illustrator. He then took up oil painting and produced major studio works characterized by the weight and density he exploited from the medium. Paintings of his, such as the Cotton Pickers, are a good example of a specific view of slavery that's problematic. There's a sense of peace and serenity upon first viewing this painting caused by Homer's facture and the lighting used in the overall composition. The painting feels soft and breathable. Homer romanticizes the task of cotton making. The girls are not wearing gloves, and those who have any experience with agriculture and harvesting crop know that picking cotton without gloves is really dangerous and painful because the older bristles on the plant are extremely sharp. The 
fact that the hands of the girls are clean, even though they are hauling their big bags of crops, does not coincide with the actuality of if the two are indeed the ones picking at all. The size of that bag is so big, and it should definitely be heavy. There's cotton overflowing both the bag and basket, but Homer idealizes this. The expressions on their faces do not look fatigued. In contrast, the face of someone working in the blistering southern sun, bent down and picking cotton all day, which would be the case with a harvest of that size. The young girls in Homer's painting seem at ease in a peaceful, billowy, and beautiful field, taking their time as if they are not on the strict time schedule held by their slave masters. Homer paints the atmosphere with a certain stillness. The tranquility of the sky is vertically mirrored in the cotton bulbs below, adding a feeling of peace to the painting. The background of the country landscape itself shows serenity in its softness and airiness, created by the strokes of the paintbrush and color palette chosen by Homer. The colors in, Homer, in Homer's piece are all leaning towards neutral and earth tones, adding a sense of calmness overall. All of these factors seem to downplay and subtly trick the viewer into forgetting the harsh realities of slavery during this time period. Serfs were romanticized in Russian art as well. Alexei Venetsyan, a virtually unknown and understudied artist outside of Russia, from Moscow, did not shy away from the principles of idealism and romanticism. Venetsyan nonetheless sympathized with the plight of the peasant and did much to popularize an idealized view of country life. His modern perspective led him to examine the peasant's social position, but the actual, but the actual signification of that peasant in his work was still romanticized. In his art pieces, Venetiana tended to focus more on women and young girls rather than on males. In his painting, Cleaning Beets, from 1820, fruits and vegetables fresh from the earth represented the, represented the attractiveness of peasant life and unembellished nature. Neither dirt or the beet juice, notorious for its day in the colonies, have made their way onto the peasant girl's blouse. Her blouse is unsoiled and bright white and is clearly the brightest aspect of the painting, making it the overall focal point. By doing so, Venetiana is suggesting that the peasant's blouse is tempting the beet to corrupt its purity and cleanliness. Painters and writers alike seize on the romantic artist convention of the peasant as an embodiment of pure, unadulterated morals and truths. Peasant culture was both a vital element of the pantheistic view of nature and the perfect foil for the dissolution of the city. Later, realist artists would expose the fallacy of this notion, depicting instead the degradation, poverty, and toil of peasant life. However, in Venetiano's time, images of the peasantry still identified with virtue, simplicity, and moral supremacy. As mentioned by Rosalind Green, the idealized illumination of the middle figure and lighting throughout as a sense of theatrical aspects to, this, to the piece, focusing in on the central figure almost like a spotlight. She absorbs the viewer's attention by immediately, immediately catching their eye via the highlights in her blouse. The central figure's details are more precise and the paint strokes composing her are more defined than that of those surrounding her. Being opposite from each other in the color wheel, that light orange bonnet contrasts the greenish blue background behind her, yet another factor in attracting the view of the audience to the center of the piece. Using these tactics to create a theatrical sense of cleaning meets, Venetianov idealizes and romanticizes Russian peasants of this time. Although Russia and the United States are from two places across the world, there are countless similarities and relationships to be made in Winslow's a cotton pickers and Venetianov's cleaning beads. To begin, the facial expressions throughout both pieces are comparable. Even the figures behind the young girl cleaning the beads in Venetianov's painting play a part in this aspect. The expression on each of the subject's faces deliver a calm and tranquil sensation in the paintings. There is a sense of hollowness and yearning in their eyes, adding to the wonder and softness of both paintings. There's no eye contact to be made in these works. The girls are all looking off into the distance or away from the viewer's gaze, as if ashamed. The faces of the girls in Homer's paintings have, a, have an angry or sad expression. It seems that the backgrounds are rendered in a softer approach than the main figures. The focus in Venetiano's piece is especially strong, adding little to the background behind a sheet of haze. This softness creates and adds wonderment to the works. Additionally, each work contains centralized figures, creating a spotlight effect while drawing the attention of the viewer at the same time. The main figures are both doing some type of meticulous and traditional servant work, in a way that makes the otherwise dirty task appear simple and clean. Throughout both paintings, there is an abundance of hands present. 
Although the hands are the body parts that are actually doing the works of both paintings, like cleaning the beads and picking the cotton, the arrangement and expressions of the hands are relaxed and delicate. The audience misinterprets the actuality of slave life, like hardship, pain, and suffering, through the skewed reality of the painting scene, resting comfortably. Both of the labors consist of the bounty of the earth, the cotton and the beads both part of the land. The settings of the piece are similar as well in the sense that they are both out in nature. Although Veneziano was earlier than Homer, his cleaning beats and Homer speaking cotton both romanticize and idealize servants in comparable methods. Another artist from this time, Eastman Johnson, was an American painter and co-founder of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in NYC. He is best known for his genre paintings, paintings of scenes from everyday life, and his portraits of everyday people and prominent Americans. His painting, A Ride for Liberty, is another word dramatizing slavery in the United States in the, later in the 19th century. This painting of a slave family escaping the Union lines during the Civil War dramatizes the experience of thousands of slaves who thereby became contrabands and gained their freedom. Most of them came on foot, but this enterprising family stole hearts as well as themselves from their master. The story behind the painting alone is already almost as dramatic as one can get. It's a snapshot of an adventurous and daring time. Something that differs from this painting to those previously mentioned is the fact that the slaves are in charge here. They are superior to their masters in this moment. They're taking the initiative to escape, obviously without permission, instead of continuing their life of obeying orders. Although the theme of this painting is courageous and heroic, the former aspects do not fully convey this. Though the horse is running at a high speed, the postures and body language of the figures do not match that of slaves finally escaping the terrors of slavery. The body language also does not match up with the speed of the horse, as they would be leaning from the speed and not just casually relaxing. The facial features of the slaves are mostly hidden, not allowing the ownership of an identity as a slave, but as, but as if these people were just another one of a number of those who had done the same as them. Another romantic characteristic of this piece that stood out to me was the fact that the, band, the background landscape is so indistinct and misty. It looks like it was painted with hurried strokes. This truly contributes to the horse's speed, as if they were running so fast that everything behind was no longer reality, but as an indistinguishable blur of history. In all of these ways, Johnson romanticizes American slaves in the 1860s. Contrastingly, Veneziano's In the Plow Field has an atmosphere that is relaxed and tranquil. This is a characteristic of the Tavera countryside, subdued greens and quiet earth colors that can be seen in all of his work. He conveyed the vastness of the Russian land by lowering the horizon to enhance the immensity of the sky over its flat open spaces, a technique derived from icon painting. This relaxed atmosphere is also achieved by the use of the dim, yet crisp colors that the slow movements of the horses and the woman's server bringing forth the daintiness of the trees. Again, the look on the peasant's face is carefree. Her hands are loose as she scarcely she scarcely clutches onto the earth as she guides the horses through the mass and almost empty field. Veneziana is undertaking a symbolic study of a peasant and her child in various ways. Veneziana combines the distinctive Russian features of his female laborer with the sculptural proportions of an antique heroine. By doing this, Veneziana has made the woman in the field a peasant goddess. She's mother of the Russian land. Her arms are spread out, mimicking an angel, giving her a powerful eminence and a resemblance of a Greek goddess. The way she reigns over the horses appears unrealistically proportionally larger than they are, adding to her goddess quality. As mentioned in Rosaline Gray's The Real and Ideal in the Works of Alexei Veneziana, despite her peasant origin, the central figure has a monumentality, emphasized by the low horizon and the diminutive size of the two horses. She dominates the landscape, walking barefooted over the furrowed earth her gliding motion emphasized by her forward thrust of her hips, which were silhouetted in pink against the brown coat of the animal behind. In reality, the woman whose ceremonial headdress is completely inappropriate for agricultural labor would tread gingerly over the rough earth, the rough earth exhausted after the day's work. She is glowing, draped in beautiful clothing to match. Her hair glistens in the sunlight, and you can almost feel the warmth when she's looking at her rosy cheeks are prevalent as well, giving her a very well nourished look. The peasant woman does not need shoes, even though there are sharp objects and natural debris painted alongside her and throughout the picture. Her bare feet add to, the, add to the superiority feeling of the painting, as if she reigns and is dominant over nature. 
In addition, she uh, does not seem to mind that her baby is sitting alone in this field with horses and rocks nearby. Veneziano seems to have incorporated the baby in the painting as a representation of fertility and naiveness, adding to the romanticism of the purity of peasants that he was notorious for. By using these methods, Veneziano idealized and romanticized peasants in his own way. Although they both are paintings of two completely different circumstances, there are still many instances in which Johnson's arrival for liberty, the fugitive slaves, and Veneziano's in the plow field are comparable. To begin, there is a sense of superiority in both works. In Arrive for Liberty, the runaway slaves are in control for once, giving off a heroic atmosphere. The same could be said for Veneziano's piece. The horses are the ones doing the work of plowing the field for her as she strolls along carefree. The calmness of the figures is yet another aspect that is similar in both of these pieces. Regardless of the fact that they are in the midst of a heated escape in Johnson's piece, the slaves have a very loud ambiance to them. This is similarly achieved in Veneziano's work as well. Even though the female peasant is outside in the sunlight doing what, what would conventionally be a labor-intensive chore for her masters, she appears easy and care easygoing and carefree, as if she's not completely working at all. In both pieces, it is as if the situation and emotions do not match up evenly with one another. Even though both pieces are paintings of two wholly different situations, there still remains characteristics in which they are comparable in both romanticizing and idealizing slaves during this time period. Across the globe, slavery was romanticized and idealized in many ways, regardless of the circumstances, especially when looking at the U.S. and Russia during the early 1800s. In Russia, there was an internal servitude within the white race, whereas in the United States, it was totally different, as Africans were brought over from their native land and forced into servitude. Although peasants and African slaves led completely different lives and had different expectations from their masters, many similarities remained in the way they were both romanticized for the sake of the white man. about Russian art and history. 
And then I took a class at UL where we kind of started to dive into Russian art. And um, I was already interested in a way, so I just kind of kept dating. And um, I became in interested in the peasantry and then just started to make those connections just because I live in the South. And, and <coughs> I have some, I guess they're more comments than, than questions, but this brought up so many interesting relationships. Um, I would suggest looking at Chardin, who had this kind of nobility of the peasant. They're more interiors, but they really um, reminded me of uh, Venette Sinon, um, as well as the, um, the plow field. Um, to me, that was Demeter. Right, and she she is just like the goddess, you know, in the field. You even have maybe baby Persephone, you know, down there with the flowers. Um, and something about the horizon line. You mentioned the icons, the Russian icons. I would also look towards Dutch painting, which has the very same low horizon line, and even West Texas, because anywhere you live where there it's just flat, the sky is so much more important, and um, they're very pro profound that noticing that. Um, so those were just more, more comments about it. Great, great comparisons. Mm -hmm. Yes? I thought it was really interesting how you said these artists were willing to depict slavery and serfdom, but then they romanticized it and idealized it. But were there paintings from this time that were willing to show it, this life and all its brute, harsh reality and everything? Oh, so I mentioned at the beginning, like, but there were a few black artists, I think it was a little bit later, that were really showing the more rough side of it. That was truer. Um, Henry Tanner, and there was one other one that I mentioned. But as far as like in Russia, I don't think that was happening at all. Um, maybe more in America, though. Don't think so. Later on. Yes. Um, when these paintings were produced, do you think they would have been seen as like? Propaganda, like where would people, uh, the average person at the time, have access to it? I guess I'm speaking more towards the Russian paintings. I'm not sure. Okay. Honestly, just curious. That's uh, an interesting question. I, I have a comment on that because if you look at the history <laughs> of painting, this was actually very profound to show peasants and poor people because before then it was Napoleon on his horse or, right. you know. So just the fact, even if they are shown, you know, idealistically and romantically, it's a step, it's a step in that right, right. this now becomes a subject to be, these people exist. They're right. out there in the fields. They're working. They are worthy of being the subject of a painting, right? Mm. I don't want to say his intentions, but that might have been an easier way for people to process what was going on. 